Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes? Great. Um, I'm Kristen Boddy. I'm the Membership and Events Manager at the Asheville Art Museum. I want to thank you all for being here for today's member program. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Gary Israel, who will be speaking about his mother, artist and sculptor Dorothy Gillespie, the evolution of her work, her role advancing recognition for female artists, and the Dorothy M. Gillespie Foundation. If you've visited the museum recently, you have probably seen some of the wonderful Gillespie's sculptures we have up in Perspective Cafe. They add a really fun, whimsical element to the space. And today, Gary is joining us from his mom's studio in New York, and so we'll get to see a lot more of her work. Um, and so before I turn this over to Gary, I do just want to go over some housekeeping for all our attendees. Uh, you should note that all microphones are muted by default. We are recording today's program, so if you prefer not to be recorded, Recorded, please make sure that your video remains off. Both the microphone and video camera symbols at the bottom left of your screen will have red lines through them to indicate when they're off. Um, this recording will be shared tomorrow in our e-newsletter and on our YouTube channel. And if you'd like to make any questions or sorry, make any comments or ask any questions during the program, please feel free to write those in the chat box, which you'll also find at the bottom of your screen or by clicking more at the bottom of your screen. And I encourage you to ask your questions as we go and I'll read those at appropriate stopping points. Um, and I will be sending out an evaluation after this program to collect your feedback uh, for today. And please do let us know if there's anything you think we can do to improve our format within Zoom. Um, and finally, the museum is once again open for visitors. Um, it's been really gratifying for staff to see folks in the galleries again. Um, and although we have reopened, we are operating at a reduced capacity with a lot of new protocols in place for the safety of our members, visitors, and staff. If you're able, consider making a contribution to the museum by visiting our support page on our website at ashevilleart.org. Every little bit helps, and as members, you support our many educational programs and exhibitions, as well as collection care and the small things like keeping the lights on. Um, so thank you again for your dedication to the museum, and now I will turn this over to Gary. Kristen, good afternoon. I want to thank you for inviting me uh, to share this wonderful studio um, with the people, lovely people in Nashville Museum. Um, this studio was built 25 years ago. My mother had studios in Dallas or Lauderdale, Hollywood. Of course, Miami, where we lived for 10 years, Orlando. Her main studio was in New York City. Uh, after she passed away years ago, at the age of 92, uh, I decided to I had to make a decision. And I picked this studio because it's located in four acres up here in the Catskill Mountains. And it's 20 minutes away from uh, Bethel Woods, known as Woodstock, it's along the Delaware River. So it's a gorgeous place. And later I'll talk more about what the foundation has been doing in terms of inviting student interns to live up here. And uh, we'll be inviting artists to actually do art residencies here because it's such a beautiful location. So on my mother's 100th birthday, she turned 100 June 29th. I couldn't be more excited to share this studio with people in North Carolina. And please feel free to ask questions. Uh, and I look forward to uh, to starting. Thanks, Gary. Uh, I do just, yes, I just wanted to mention, it sounds like the sound quality is a little bit off. Uh, it's a little jumpy. So I was just hoping maybe uh, the person assisting you can uh, check your connection. Yeah. I, I hear you a little jumpy too, so it's both ways. Is, is that any better? Yes, actually. Well, the, the great thing is my mother's art speaks. So even if we can't talk, her art will do the talking. It's so colorful. 
that uh, we don't need sound. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me, but we'd like to start at her early college years, art school. So as you can see, we have lots of files here and there's so many different types of artwork, drawings, pastels, but I wanna concentrate just for a short time on the years that she spent at MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art. And I think, Kristen, you're showing some of the early drawings from the 30s that my mother uh, Not right now, but I'd be happy to share that. I, I wanted to make sure you were okay. able to first show this. Just so happens I have a whole drawer full. These were done in 38, 39, 40 when she was uh, an art student at MICA. And as you can see, these are all things you wouldn't associate with my mother, the abstract artist that she became. But Ina Jackson Pollock had to start this way. And so her early works, you can see, and they're just a drawer full of them. But what I found interesting, and every time I open a drawer or I go into the studio, I find something different. This, done in 1940, Nineteen forty, you can see the different colors. So back then she was twenty, but colors were important to her. I recently found this, and I when I saw it, I thought it was a computer. Yes, <laughs> uh, I thought this was a computer, but actually my mother did it in nineteen thirty nine, so she was eighteen years old, and if you can see the detail, which is extraordinary. I mean, I knew she had a lot of patience, but just seeing this work was amazing. And I'll show you a couple more things. I think I have to go to these. This was done in 1939. This was done in 1940. Gary, could you move the screen down just a little bit? There we go. Yeah. So these drawers are just full of drawings that she did in college that I found after she passed away. And I'm in the process of cataloging, inventory, photograph them and, okay so that people will be able to see them. Uh, my plans with the studio, as we move on to the other part of the studio, is to turn this into a museum study center. So as we move here, we're gonna go to her moving to New York. And she moved to New York in 1943. <laughs> as you can see, there's metal sculptures all around. But I think it's important to start after art school because it tells a lot about this young 23-year-old fearless person who moved to Greenwich Village, didn't have a job, didn't have an apartment, but within the first week she had five job offers and she ultimately started to work at B. Altman as a commercial artist. She did uh, the windows, she was very excited, but she needed an apartment. And the apartment she found was in Greenwich Village because all young artists at that time wanted to live in Greenwich Village in New York. And it turns out that she found the apartment on the fifth floor of a bar that my father owned. And so if you look closely, this was a self-portrait. My mother did a lot of self-portraits and I'll show you some other portraits uh, that she did too. This was done in 1943, the year that she moved to New York City. This is a very important self-portrait. It's dated 1946, and it's signed Gillespie Israel. That's significant because that was the year she got married. But it's also significant because 
all her works after 1946, after she got married, were signed Gillespie or D. Gillespie because that was the year she became a feminist. She thought, why should I give my husband any credit for what I'm doing? And let me just hit this there. And so this was a portrait that, that my mother did of my father in 1946 when they got married. And I found this, of course, after my mother passed away and I saw this in the studio. But I also saw this portrait in the nightclub that my parents owned. When they got married, my mother and father bought a nightclub called La Salle de Champagne. It was a nightclub. It was a nightclub. Oh, there we go. Okay, so those are the drawings. Yeah. Ah, there it is. So this is a nightclub in Greenwich Village that was quite unique. It was, um, there were celebrities, many celebrities that came there, Barry Grant, Jelly Winters, Charlie Chaplin. Uh, it was sort of described as a gallery, art gallery, cocktail lounge, and nightclub. A place where young artists exhibit and sell their works without commission to galleries. A cocktail lounge where young actors and actresses who pound the pavements from agent to agent during the day work as bartenders and matrices at night. An informal nightclub where impromptu style, talented guests and waitresses use club patrons as a sounding board for fresh new mu musical skits, sketches and songs. So here my mother is 26 years old. She marries my father, who's 36. He had two children, divorced, she has this art career during the day and at night she's in this nightclub there's her portrait self-portrait on the wall and my father's portrait on the wall so as we go around here you'll see some of the portraits that my mother did and what's significant is you will not find one portrait of her children <laughs> because she knew we wouldn't want to sit or stand that's a self-portrait now, Rackard University in Virginia has the most portraits that my mother did. And so I'm hoping in the future to have an exhibition of all her portraits. But these were all found in the studio that I, I came on after uh, eight years of working in here. And what's, what's interesting is when I see a portrait like this, try to match up to a person that, that my mother knew and I, I discovered this is Joanne Ryan who now has become a good friend of mine so it's like I'm in a time castle when I come in here because I can go back to her early years and learn so much about my mother and of course her friends so as we move Towards the abstract expressionism, you'll see how my mother's early works over here. This is a good example of her early works from the 40s. And I think, Kristen, you have one of her early pieces from 1944. Let me try to pull that it's up. Called for the you. Dancers. There, that's the Dancers. So you can see that it's, she's not quite abstract there. It's beginning to be abstract, 1944, she's 24 years old. She hasn't really, she's experimenting. And here, same thing, you can say that this painting is an abstract expressionist painting, but yet you can see a mountain, you can see a river, pretty much you can see what you want. Just, okay. And then over here, this is a, a piece that I remember as a child. So this was the early 50s. This is now a period of time when we moved to Florida. We moved to Florida in 1953. And what's significant about this period is that my mother decided that it was time to leave New York City and leave all the abstract expressionists at the time 
uh, the Louise Nevelsons, Lee Krasners, Jackson Pollocks, all those artists were there in the village. But my mother wanted to go out on her own. And she also felt that by going to Florida, she wouldn't have to dress us in winter clothes. It would be much easier. But we had a great life in Florida. But then in 1963, it was time to move back to Manhattan. And so we'll go over to that period in time because what was going on in Manhattan, New York City, at the time was called the environment and happenings. And my mother had four, would you come over here? Mm -hmm. She had several shows, environment and happenings, but the one that she got the most recognition was the flag show. And actually the New York Times did a, an amazing article about that show. And I just like to read it a uh, small part. The Sunday Review by Alfred Clark said, quote, a modern day Betsy Ross named Dorothy Gillespie figured that she had cut, sip, shaped, and painted about 3,500 stars of mylar. Yep, that's the mylar that she used here. And that's a very significant period of her time because She'd gone to the World's Fair and she discovered Mylar. And if she had never discovered Mylar, uh, I don't know if she would have gone to metal because she loved Mylar. She could do so much with it. And so this show was amazing. Uh, I was, I think, third, I was a teenager and I remember going there and being so proud of my mother because the reception, it, it was so well received. So. This was an important time in my mother's life where she really wasn't painting too much. And the paintings that I found were different. This is one during that period in the 60s. And if you look at it, it's mylar, aluminum foil, and paint. And so she's thinking metal, even though she hasn't gotten to metal. And I found these also, metal and paper. So she's thinking metal, but not quite there yet. So after the environment and happenings, she reaches, um, she experiments with paper. Paper was an important part of her discovering before getting to metal. And there was a show at NYU with paper and I'm very happy that I still have some of the paper that was on rolls that was displayed in staircases and this was this was important because she wanted people to be involved in her art she wanted it to come off the wall and it was an expensive paper there's a good example of, of some of the paper that I have here. You can see here. So there, there are rolls and rolls of it. And I still have these tubes that she used. And you can see some of them in the background. This is NYU. And these tubes have mylar. It's not metal, it's cardboard. But you can see now her wanting to get into that three dimension. So how does she go from paper to metal? Well, there's a process. She goes over here. She actually attaches metal here to pa paper to metal. And I'm going, I had never seen this before. And I said, wow, that's a lot of work. And she probably felt the same way. And then I found this, which is actually steel canvas, where she painted on a canvas. And then attached the canvas to the steel. Well, she had a, 
bright idea. Why not just paint directly onto the metal? And she got away from steel because steel is heavy. She always said that she needed to do light metal so she didn't need any assistance to help her move it around. That's how she gets to aluminum. And metal uh, becomes her signature. And of course, her biggest exhibition was Rockefeller Center. That's where she was known. Uh, 2003, she created 186 pieces for the exhibition. And I have a couple of those sculptures here. This was this piece here, this gold piece, was actually at the front of the Rockefeller Center exhibition. You can see that. And then over here, this is one of eight totems. Totem. And if you look closely, you can see this is all aluminum. And they're riveted. And the time that it took for her to do this, it was six months to create this. And I think, is there, yeah, I think you have, yeah, okay. <laughs> We're going to get to the starburst. So there we go. That's the Rockefeller Center. So this piece here was in front of the Rockefeller Center show. And this was an extraordinary installation. As I said, it took her six months. Um, people came over. The celebrities came over. I remember Robert Wagner and Jill St. John stopping by. And, and I said, would you like to meet my mother? And they said, Yes, of course. And so I got to introduce them and she told them about the process and all. She actually invited them to the opening and unfortunately they couldn't make it, uh, but that's just as well because it was really about my mother. They had the installation on the ice skating rink. What I'd like to show you next is, that, oh, there she is in the studio. She was 83 building, uh, that's the totem, the blue totem. The, Green is the one that's in the back there, and the student. So at 83, here she is creating 186 pieces. But what's also amazing is after the installation, she would love to drive people around so they could see it in the, her car. So at 83, 84, she's driving in Manhattan. What that says is the type of person she was, fearless, risk taker, um, and it was shown in her work. I mean, this, oh, let's show you this piece here. This is, to me, one of her signature pieces. It's a totem, but it's all different colors. And again, it's very intricate. You can see all the rivets that she used. There was a reason she was called Dorothy the Riveter, because of the, the, the rivets, the amount of rivets that she would use. In fact, I'm going to show you the sculpture that was in Orlando, Florida, where she actually used a hundred and, no, ten thousand. This is the sculpture. Sixty-two feet high, ten thousand ribs put that up. Unfortunately, there was a hurricane. It got damaged. And my mother had to um, repair it. And she said, no, I think I'll just create a new one. And that is the one where you see her bending their starbursts. So there's 720 starbursts. So from a 62 foot sculpture here, she cuts these up. She goes into recycling. And there's 720 there. Over here, I found these maquettes. And there aren't many artists that I know that do the size work that my mother does and does maquettes. But my mother always felt, I found these for the Rockefeller Center show, she would do these maquettes before the actual creating the sculptures. So she knew the size and what would fit and how it would look. These are the totems, and if you look closely, I still can't believe the time she spent doing the cutting up the papers. Each one is made up of 
you know, lots and lots of paper. I'm just I'm exhausted when I think about the time that she spent to create this work. This I actually found a couple of days ago. Uh, not what I thought was interesting was not that it was metal tall, but I was looking at what she was wearing, and it made me realize that there was a reason she was called Dorothy the Riveter, not only because of the way she uh, connected the sculptures, but the way she looked. I mean, that's, a, that's Dorothy the Riveter. So a lot of these uh, this is a was on the side of a museum in Fort Lauderdale. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. But again, she would make these pieces and then attach them so that it was a way of her getting an idea of the scale before she would create it. Uh, this is a piece that you could still see, not at Epcot. Uh, this was done in 1999 for Epcot. And it was gone for a year, and then she uh, had it donated, shown it to Radford University, and it's still up there. This I kept was recently installed in a library in Roanoke. So was that, we're going uh, to take Gary, a was that Roanoke right you said? These can you hear? Uh, yes, it's just a little jumpy, but was it Roanoke you said that where that work is installed just now? I'm sorry? Can you hear me, Gary? Yeah, I hear you. I was asking yes. if the work you just said, was it Roanoke where you said it was installed? Can you see it? Okay. Yes. Okay, these are the small uh, sculptures that were in display uh, museum shops. Now we're going to the other room, and I want you to picture my mother's studio. In, oh, right, before we go there, <laughs> forgot the stars. These are the starters. These are what my mother's known for. And as you can see, there are lots of them. There's 720 in Orlando. There are 300 in Meredith Publishing Company. Uh, Boulder Town Museum has over 200. People ask me all the time, how many starters do you think your mother has? And she made each one. Uh, or, of course, what she did was she painted on aluminum. Then she would cut them, and then she would bend them with her own hands, and she never used gloves. So that's, that is the exhibit in Orlando. That's the one that was destroyed, the solid piece, sculpture 62-foot sculpture that uh, was destroyed, and is now 720 pieces there. So as we leave this part of the studio, you can see the hundreds of stars. And I'm happy to say that there's Starburst on display on loan in Florida, in New York, all around the country. So I, I try to have it rotating so people can see them. Not only in Asheville. where they are located. In I'm sorry? In Asheville, that's what we have up on the wall. And okay, so this, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. So imagine my mother's studio in New York City. It's gray, it's cold, it's dark. And you go into the studio in Manhattan and you open the door. And now you see these bright, colorful, vibrant, exciting, joyous colors. 
There was a reason my mother was known as uh, the Wizard of Art, as in Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, because of the colors. That's what she was known for. She used over 120 pieces, uh, pieces, 120 different shades of color. Yeah, this is gold anodized. Uh, she used that at the Rockefeller Center because it weathers um, in the outdoors. I always like this piece. Um, and I've discovered sculptures, colors that I never saw before. This is a piece here, the sculpture here. Okay. If you see, it looks almost like a tie dye which is unusual for my mother. The, the color, she very rarely used those colors. But uh, so I'm always discovering whenever I come to the studio, it's been eight years since she passed away and I come to the studio every week to work and it's a work in progress. It's a live studio. And I think that's why a uh, studio was so important to my mother. She always told everyone, you must have a studio. And uh, I now have a studio. This is a very interesting piece because it comes apart. My mother was more than an artist, a painter, a sculptor. She was truly an engineer because if you look at the intricacy and the workmanship that she did. And I like this piece because it's flat and yet three dimensional very easy to clean. It's enamel on aluminum. All her sculptures are enamel on aluminum. This piece here is three-dimensional, of course, and it also comes apart. But as you can see, it's a nightmare to clean it. It's just the time that she took to, to bend all this metal. And of course, it makes a lot of noise. This was an interesting piece. This was actually donated by, uh, here in the corner, by a collector. And when a collector donates a piece back to the Dorothy and Gillespie Foundation, it gives me an opportunity to learn more about my mother and, of course, the significance of the piece and why she created it. So the collector said, I had your mother come out to my house and I needed a corner piece on a staircase, huge home. And your mother came to the house, looked at the space, went back to the studio and created it. And my mother loved to do site specific where that would happen all the time. I was out in Dallas a few years ago, sitting in a chair looking at my mother's art and the collector said, you know, Gary, your mother sat where you're sitting for one hour and didn't say a word. And he said, I didn't know what she was doing, but I realized that she was looking at the space and thinking what would go there. So there's always a story behind, and that's why I'm really excited about the uh, upcoming film project. Actually, we're working on it right now. We started, the, it's a two year film project uh, called Darth, Discovering Dorothy Gillespie. And it's a, live project because it changes every day. Everyone we've interviewed, 50 people so far. So we'll let you know when the film comes out. This piece here is a flat, again, enamel on aluminum. It's one of eight, eight pieces. So you can imagine how large the wall must be to display that. And these are, this would be something that would be in a collector's home or would be purchased in a gallery. And these are similar to the Starburst, but these actually can be put on the wall or on the table or part of a sculpture, which I believe is uh, at Asheville Art Museum. It's part of, uh, of the sculpture. Uh, 
That's the sound of aluminum. Are there any questions while we're going? Yes, we've had a Is couple it? come in. Can you hear me? So Laurel was wondering what your yeah, favorite I, I hear you fine. Can you I think there might be a bit of a delay, Gary, but here we have more of the small pieces over here. The more small pieces. Later in my mother's life, when she was in her late 80s, she started to experiment with these small sculptures. This was something that uh, she had macular degeneration, and so it was much easier for do the, to do these than the real large pieces. And we go out here. This was my mother's favorite place. Four acres, beautiful. Uh, it gave her an opportunity to get away from the city and see the deer. And there's a small sculpture there. Okay, let's go back in. And on this side of the wall, actually, is the kitchenette. My mother insisted that uh, she wanted a kitchen with a full stove, which I said, Mom, you never cook for your children. At your age, you're going to start cooking. Well, it was never used, but now I use it. And it's, it's very useful, of course, for the interns that are here during the summer. This summer, because of the pandemic, uh, of course, uh, there have been no interns, but next summer, I already have students from the University of Central Florida, and I open the internship up to any student from one of the universities that my mother had relationships with. And there are actually 40 schools that my mother visited, coached, mentored, uh, had exhibitions, jury shows. So uh, I expect in the future to have a lot of students here who will be doing their work, also helping me inventory and also a catalog of photograph tomorrow. Gary, can I ask you some of the questions that have come about up? Yeah. Okay, so we have one that just came in asking about the movie project and wondering if there are videos of her working in the studio or interviews with her. In where? I'm sorry? Working in the studio or interviews with her. It, can you not hear me? It might be easiest if you pull up the chat box. I know. If you I, can't hear me. You're breaking break, you know. up. You might want to pull up the chat box if you can't hear me. Um. I, I, I can't hear. Can you not see that? Can you hear me? Yes. But if you uh, can, it, can you not hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. I can hear okay. you now. I was recommending that you pull up the chat box if you're not able to hear me well. Okay. Okay, great, got it. Okay, question. All right. uh, what is your favorite piece of hers? You know, it's like asking, um, what's your favorite, uh, child. <laughs> uh, she did so many different things and I keep discovering that's that's what's amazing and I 
I invite people to come up here all the time and discover all the different mediums that she worked on. I do like her early paintings. I've got to be honest, uh, because it represented my time, I, I think, as a child in Florida, and those were good memories, and I was so excited at that time because my mother was such an important person down in Florida at the time. So I, I just have so many fond memories of her, her art down in Florida, but I, I love it all. Uh, and yeah, I can't say a, fi a favorite piece. Um, question? Yes, I just wrote one into the chat box. For the movie project, are there videos of her working in the studio or interviews with her? Oh, absolutely. Actually, there have been four documentaries already that PBS did, uh, which was alive. And they were from the 80s, 90s, uh, 2000. The last one, I think, was probably about 10 years ago. Um, and I recently edited a 12-minute video uh, called, um, in her own words, or I think Gillespie in her words, her own words, where she's speaking, because it's so important for an artist to, to talk about the process. Yeah, so, yeah, she's been um, at Rockefeller Center on TV. Uh, so this film project is really, I couldn't be more excited. I, I meet with the film project, uh, the filmmakers. We talk all the time. Uh, as I said, they've interviewed a lot of people. And I think once this film project comes out, I'm always learning new things about my mother. And I think um, I know someone, an oral historian, has compared my mother to uh, Ra Rauschenberg, which I thought was quite a compliment. And I think when people hear the whole story about my mother, uh, and they'll see that it's not just what you see back here, but it's her involvement in the women's movement that was so important. She co-founded the Women's Inner Art Center. I remember her wearing a sign around her neck uh, when she ticketed the Whitney Museum. Uh, because artists, women artists, weren't allowed to show their work in museums and galleries. My mother organized women to have galleries uh, shows outside. <laughs> yeah. She was very involved in 1975 in the Women's Year, Women's Art Festival. And, and so I was always proud of her, her involvement with the women's movement and her role at the New School. It was, of course, she taught for women artists. It was very important, uh, functioning in the art world. Many artists don't know how to run a studio as a, uh, a business. And my mother ran her studio as a business. She had two, two uh, assistants, and, and she had interns that would come and work with her. So, um, yeah. Her role as a woman's movement, I think, is, is something that needs to be told and will be told. Uh, but that's just one aspect. It's, it's uh, just her, her giving, her generosity. She was Woodrow Wilson teaching fellow. That meant that she would go to small schools, not the big schools, because big schools will always have artists from New York City, but small schools never had New York City artists come uh, to talk and coach and mentor, and so she she did that. A lot of people don't know that she did that. And I said before that she went to over forty universities. Well, that's the four universities where her work is on in, in a permanent collection. She would donate art to hospitals, and uh, of course, universities have her art. So with all this art out here now. That brings us to the foundation and what I want to do with the foundation. When she passed away, I became president of the foundation. And, and one of the things I'm doing is continuing her mission of education. Uh, I've established 14 art scholarships. I recently established an art scholarship in North Carolina. 
and I'm sure there will be others, uh, University of North Carolina in Wilmington, and there are uh, seven states that have established art scholarships where my mother had a, a role in their schools. So that's one of the things that I, um, I feel very important of the foundation is to continue that. And of course, her role in the women's movement, I support women's organizations with grants. Um, I support hospitals with art. Art is very healing, and I think my mother's art is very healing, so that's something that I want to do. Um, internships, very important, where I have students at Rutgers University, actually two students are, have a grant to do um, digitizing my mother's archives that are there. So there's a lot of work that I want the foundation continue to do and I'm making arrangements for when I'm no longer here that it will continue and those plans are in the works now. So great questions? thanks Gary. Yeah there was one other question that came in from Laurel asking uh, what do you think was your mother's biggest inspiration? Uh, what was her inspiration? Wow. Um, she would say New York City, she got her energy from New York City. She had a studio from 1972 until she passed away in 2012. She would be inspired, but what's fascinating and I learned after she passed away is although she created her work in New York City, her work is all over the country. And that's why I've traveled over 50,000 miles in the car to over nine different cities, tracking down the art and her, the people. So she would do her work in the city, and then she would go to universities all over the country, galleries, uh, museums. Um, so yeah, New York City was her inspiration. In terms of a person, the old artist, um, yeah, they inspired her also. Great. Uh, those are all the questions we have right now, but if anyone else has anything else they'd like to ask Gary, please feel free to put it in the chat box. Um, but Gary, I think, uh, would you want me to show some of the images that you had shared of works in collectors' homes? Yeah, did you, uh, one of the things I've done is, it's been like a detective. I've gone through my mother's archives before I donated them to Rutgers University, and I tried to get locations of where my mother's art is, not only in museums and uh, universities, but in collectors' homes, yes. And that has been a treat. Because, again, not only do I get to see this art that no one's seen, except for the collectors, but I get to see, I get to hear the story behind it. And the story is really what it's all about. My mother, it, her art connects. And that's one of the mission, uh, the directions of the film. It's not that it's just pretty art, but it's how her art has connected. The art that's on the bottom screen, um, with the gentleman on the lower right hand side, that art was donated last year to the foundation. I immediately turned around, I waited a year, and then I, I, I'm donating, I'm in the process of donating it. So this collector has enjoyed it for years, and now I'm able to let the public enjoy it. So her art is something that the public can enjoy as the collector. <laughs> I love the, the Starburst. And that story was amazing. When they told me that your mother was here for four days installing this, and I said, how can my mother be here for four days and, and do the work in the studio? And, Oh, no, she was here for four days. 
I still don't understand how she was able to create as much art. But that ceiling, you have to see the size of that house to appreciate what those starbursts look like. And so when I walk into the house and I see the sculpture for the first time, and I take a photograph, um, the sculpture on the right, lower right, what a story. I go into this person's home, and one of the things that all these collectors had in common is they love art. Of course. And they have some of the most amazing art, Picasso, um, Rachenberg, uh, you name it, Pollock. And that piece of sculpture is in the living room. And they have all their the famous artists in other rooms. And I go, why do you have my mother's art there when you have all this music? Amazing we love it. So it resonates with people. And that's something that I said before, my mother's art speaks. And I think when people see this film, they will appreciate not only how her, the art speaks, but the music. We're going to spend a lot of time, we talk about the music that's gonna go with this art. Yeah. Um, I can tell you the day, where it is, Birmingham, Bradford, Orlando, uh, and, and stories that they've shared and people I've never met, this is the first time I've met, and I share stories with them about my mother's life, and they find that fascinating because my mother never shared stories. My mother was all about the moment. She never talked about her life in New York City, marrying my father and the nightclub. They didn't know that she had three nightclubs. When we were in Florida, she had a nightclub. When we moved back to New York, she bought another nightclub. So my mother was, during the day, she was an artist. At night, she was a host. She had a radio program. And she still saw her kids off to school. Extraordinary woman. Uh, my inspiration, and I hope she'll be an inspiration to young artists. And that's why I've opened up the studio to women, young women, college artists, students, so that they could be inspired. Uh, the sculpture on the left was amazing. I was flown out to Cleveland to install that. I've never been in a home that size. I've never been in a home of a billionaire. I can't tell you his name, of course, he's anonymous. Uh, extraordinary home. Um, he wanted it installed a certain way. I suggested that it be installed differently. My, my mother would have wanted, but when you're a billionaire, you, you don't argue with that person. Uh, the person on the right, that it, you can't see it because it's three dimensional. You have to see my mother's art in person or on film. Uh, I think the film will certainly show the, the three-dimensional more than a photograph. But it just, it, it works. Uh, the sculpture on the left, I couldn't be more excited that that sculpture is now on display in the Performing Arts Center at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington, where students faculty, staff, the public gets to see it, and the collector was downsizing and um, donated them. So thank you to the collector. Um, the piece on the right, uh, I mean, I haven't seen many of those. My mother, one of the reasons my mother was never represented by a gallery, she had, you know, tons of galleries, probably 50, 60 galleries where she sold her work, but to be represented by a New York City gallery means you do, you create what the gallery thinks. So that piece with the woman with the pink, a gallery would say, Dorothy, the public would love this. We need you to make a hundred of these. And my mother never would do that. So there are very few of those that I've seen. So when I went into this person's home and I saw it, I go, wow, so great. Um, so yeah, wow, those pieces.
and it's, it's hard to take a photo of them because the piece on the left, uh, and you can tell that the homes of these collectors are huge and because they need to be. And, and this is where my mother would go to the place, the home before. And actually, there, there's a maquette on the, the one on the right that I just noticed that I forgot to show, but that's exactly what that piece on the right is. She did a maquette um, in her studio so that she could see how it would look in, in that space. And, yep. Oh, so the foundation. Yeah, I, I couldn't be more proud of what my mother left me, not just her art, but her dedication to education because that inspired me to, to do these scholarships. Um, I was recently up at the Niagara University and I established an art scholarship up there. Of course, there's an art scholarship established at her alma mater, Micah. And I'm happy to say in 2026, it's their 200th anniversary. And the president of MICA, who was just recently interviewed for the film project, um, has asked if my mother's legacy will be part of that celebration. Now, MICA has had some very famous alum, Jeffrey Coons, Jeff Coons, is the one that recently sold the rabbit for $72 million. And when I mentioned to Sam Hoy, the president, how proud he must be to have a alum who was so famous. He looked at me and he said, yes, but what has Jeff Coons done for women artists? And he said, but look at what your mother has done for artists, what her legacy is. And I think that's probably the best compliment someone could give my mother because my mother never wanted to be famous. She went out of her way actually to get away fame, away from being famous. Uh, that's the reason we left Florida uh, because she was getting too famous and she had come back to New York City to be anonymous. And that's why she never wanted the Rock Color Central to be uh, in the public. In the, on the press, newspapers, she stopped me from going to actually speak to the Today Show to invite them to come over and interview. She says that, she told me, she says, I don't believe in promoting myself. And that's the way she lived her life. She didn't want social media, she didn't want business cards, anything like that. It's all about creating the art. And I think that's, that's inspiration because artists, you never think about fame and money. Uh, she did tell me you should always have enough money so that you never depend on your husband. And I can be honest and say that my mother never asked my father for one penny. She always made enough. She said so that she would have enough for, uh, for her paint supplies. And that's her advice to young artists that and make sure you sign your name, your first name, so that men know that a woman did it. Because if you sign a D. Gillespie, you could be David Gillespie, especially with her big sculptors. No man could think that she created that. So yeah, there's a, a lot to be told, more to be told. Uh, I'm looking at doing an oral history and of course, see about a memoir and it's again it's not about fame or fortune it's just to let share her story which I think resonates with a lot of young women artists and uh, good role model great thank you so, so much so Gary you know can hear me <laughs> yes we can hear you um, we're just about out of time and I just want to thank you so much yeah. for touring us around your mom's studio talking about her um, it's such a treat to get to see behind the scenes like this um, and well, uh, I apologize I apologize if I, if I talk a lot one of the things I do when I go in to meet with the president of the university or museum director, and I think even with you, when we first met, I said, Kristen, how much time do we have? 
because um, I could go on and on. There's just so much to talk about. But I think the bottom line is let her art talk. But if you see her art and you now know more about her persona, I think you appreciate the work more than just it's colorful and cheerful. Absolutely. Um, I think it's so. <laughs> it's something to see for sure. And hopefully when it's safe to travel again, you can start welcoming people back into the studio space to see all this in person. Um, so thank you again. I, I really appreciate you being here and sharing all of this with us. Um, and I want to thank our members for being here today. Um, and I hope you will. Well, oh, sorry. Go on, Gary. I broke up, but I look forward to visiting the museum. I should have said earlier, it is one of my favorite museums, and I share that as I travel around. I don't tell directors or museums that, but I certainly tell all the collectors and all the people. I love Asheville. It's a very artsy community, and this, this area here is very artsy, so it's, it's great. We have something in common, so I look forward to visiting Asheville very soon. Yes, we'll look forward to having you here. Um, and we are reopened, as I said, so you'll be able to come around and tour the galleries and see your mom's work in situ, which will be great. Um, and so thank you, everyone, again. Um, I hope you all stay well, and I'll see you in two weeks for our next member program or hopefully in the galleries. All right. Oh. <laughs> I'm leaving you with this. I love Someone it. Someone sent that to me. That's very appropriate for Asheville. Anything with a dog is great. So <laughs> thank you, Gary. I hope stay well. Bye, everyone. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.